Chapter Eight of the Adventures of Bindle by Herbert Jenkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter Eight: The Chapel Conversazione. Lady Knob Carrick's nomination of the Reverend Andrew McPhee to the vacant pastorate at the alton road chapel was her way of showing that an amnesty had been arranged between them and that mr mcfee had accepted it with the nearest approach to pleasure that he ever permitted himself miss mcfee his sister and housekeeper had sniffed but it was always difficult to discriminate between miss mcfee's physical and mental sniffs during the winter she seemed to suffer from a perpetual cold in the head it sometimes attacked her in the spring and autumn so that only during the months of june july and august could one say with any degree of certainty that miss mcfee's sniffs meant indignation and not an inflamed membrane in commemoration of his long ministry at the alton road chapel the rev mr sopley was to receive an illuminated address a purse of fifty pounds and a silver mounted hot water bottle for reasons of economy the presentation was to be made on the same occasion as the conversazione inaugurating the pastorate of mr mcfee this conversazione had been delayed for some months as miss mcfee had been forced to remain behind at barton bridge in order to recover from a particularly severe chill and also to arrange for the letting of the house in the meantime mr mcfee had taken lodgings in fulham thus freeing mr sopley whose health for some time past had not been good it had been arranged however that the retiring shepherd should be present at the celebration in order to receive the address the purse and the silver-mounted hot water bottle lady knob carrick had consented herself to make the presentation and a glee party had been arranged for to entertain the guests it had first been suggested that the services should be engaged of a man who produced rabbits out of top hats and omelettes from ladies shoes but it had been decided that such things were too secular for the occasion lady knob carrick had insisted that the words of the glee should first be submitted to her and a lengthy correspondence had taken place between her and the leader of the glee party the first list had been vetoed in its entirety one item entitled oh hush thee my baby was considered by lady knob carrick as not quite nice it might make the young girls feel self-conscious another one of a slightly humorous nature referred to a man's bleeding nose lady knob carrick had written to the leader of the glee party in uncompromising terms upon the indelicacy of submitting to her so coarse a composition after a brisk interchange of letters a programme was eventually decided upon the conversazione was held in the chapel schoolroom a considerable portion of mr hearty's drawing-room furniture had been requisitioned in order to give the place an appearance of hominess and comfort mr hearty's clock and lustres were upon the mantelpiece and mr hearty's pink candles were in the lustres chains of coloured paper to mr hearty the extreme evidences of festivity stretched from the corners of the room to the central gas bracket on which had been placed opaque pink globes nothing however could mitigate the hardness of the scriptural texts in oak oxford frames that garnished the walls prepare to meet thy god even when in gold letters entwined with apple blossoms seemed scarcely the greeting for those who had been invited to revel the wages of sin is death with violets coquetting in and out the letters is sound theology but not a convincing invitation to merry-making and so shall ye all likewise perish with primroses that seemed to have paled through long association with so terrible a menace threw out its uncompromising warning from immediately above the refreshment table on the table itself was everything that a little money could buy from fish paste sandwiches to homemade three-cornered tarts with raspberry jam baked hard peeping out at the joins as if to advertise that there was no deception millie hearty had striven to mitigate the uncompromising gloom of the text by placing evergreens about the frames but with no very pronounced success mr hearty had supplied the fruit and mr black the groceries at cost price that is to say mr hardy had taken off a halfpenny a pound from his tenpenny apples and mr black three farthings a bottle from his one and ninepenny lemon squash on the night of the conversazione mr hardy and mrs bindle arrived early in order to put finishing touches to everything mrs bindle was wearing a new dress of puce-coloured merino and mr hardy had donned a white tie in honour of the occasion 
his trousers still concertinaed mournfully down his legs until they disparately met his large and shapeless boots millie hearty was also an early arrival in her white frock she looked strangely out of place associated with her father and aunt mr hearty fidgeted about from place to place in a state of acute nervousness his eyes roving round in search of some defect in the arrangements fixed themselves upon the gas fetching a chair he mounted it and lowered in turn each burner then replacing the chair against the wall he stepped some distance back to see the effect the result was that he once more mounted the chair and readjusted the flames to the same height as before mrs bindle also moved about but always with a set purpose putting finishing touches to everything alice the hardy's maid seemed to be engaged in a game of in and out banging the door at each entry and exit in spite of the frequency with which this was done it caused mr hearty each time to look round expectantly is joseph coming he inquired of mrs bindle yes she replied but i've warned him there was a grimness in her voice that carried conviction to mr hearty thank you elizabeth thank you i was very upset the other night very he suddenly rushed away to the harmonium where one of the candles was burning smokily mr gupperduck can't come said mrs bindle as she arranged the fish-paste sandwiches he's got a meeting at hoxton mr hardy made some murmur of response as she dashed across the room to adjust three chairs that lacked symmetry i wish they'd all come alf wheezed mrs hardy hitting the front of a bright green bodice sartorially mrs hardy always ran to brilliancy i hope mr mcfee will not be late said mr hardy in a tone of gloom foreboding mr mcfee's arrival at that moment accompanied by miss mcfee put an end to this anxiety miss mcfee was a tall flat-chested angular woman of about forty with high cheekbones and almost white eyebrows and eyelashes she greeted mr hardy and the others without emotion mr mcfee had eyes for no one but milly the next arrival was the rev mr soapley all woven whiskers as bindle had once described him mournfully he shook hands with all and seating himself on the first available chair cast his eyes up towards the ceiling his habitual attitude alice sidled up to mrs bindle and in a whisper audible to all inquired am i to call out the names mum certainly alice replied mrs bindle as each guest arrives you will announce the names clearly then turning to mr hearty she said i think that you and mr mcfee ought to receive the guests at the door certainly elizabeth certainly said mr hearty there was unaccustomed decision in his voice he was glad of something definite to do striding over to mr mcfee he whispered to him and practically dragged him away from milly the two of them took up their positions near the door where they stood staring at each other as if wondering what was to happen next mrs hardy from time to time beat her chest it's me breath she confided to mr soapley then subsided into wheezing ah mr soapley changed the angle of his gaze whenever spoken to he invariably opened his mouth with a jerk as if he had been suddenly brought back from another world by someone hitting him in the wind as often as not he reclosed his mouth without further sound it was obvious to the most casual observer that he was here on earth because providence had decreed it and not from any wish of his own suddenly alice threw open the outer door mr payne and his wife mum she announced mr mcfee and mr hearty became instantly galvanized into activity not his wife corrected mrs bindle in a whisper but she is his wife protested alice indignantly ain't you mum she inquired of mrs payne mrs payne simpered her acquiescence as she turned to mr mcfee and mr hearty who had raced towards her you should say mr and mrs payne alice said mrs bindle with quiet forbearance sorry remarked alice turning to go i ain't used to this ere why can't they come in without all this yelling out of names she muttered they ain't trains mr payne a small man with a bald head and a tuft of black hair in the centre of a protruding forehead shook hands joyfully with mr mcfee and mr hearty he was wearing a black frock coat and light brown tweed trousers a white waistcoat and a royal blue tie mrs payne was a tall thin woman garbed in a narrow brown skirt with a cream-coloured bodice over elaborated with lace the sleeves of her blouse reached only just below the elbows and the cream gloves on her hands failed to form a liaison with the blouse round her neck was flung a locket suspended by a massive gold chain 
both she and mr payne were violent in their greetings after which they proceeded over to two chairs by the wall where they seated themselves and proceeded to converse in undertones mr payne drawing on a pair of black kid gloves mr and mrs withers bawled alice mrs bindle nodded approval and mr and mrs withers shook hands with mr hearty and mr mcfee much as mr and mrs payne had done mr withers carried a small sandy head on one side and a frock coat tightly buttoned over his narrow chest his smallness was emphasized by the vastness of mrs withers whose white silk bodice cut low at the neck and black skirt fitted her amorously as if the wearer's intention were to diminish her size for some time alice carried out her duties with marked success and mr mcfee and mr hardy were kept as busy as an american president at election time an unfortunate episode occurred in connection with two of the most important members of mr mcfee's flock mr tuddenham and mr musket mr tuddenham was a stout self-important little man with a red face and a don't you dare to argue with me sir air mr musket on the other hand was tall and lean with lantern jaws a sallow complexion and a white beard mr tuddenham's clothes fitted him like a glove mr musket's hung in despairing folds about his person mr tuddenham wore a high collar which cut viciously into his red neck mr musket's neckwear was nonconformist in cut mr tuddenham glared at the world through fierce bloodshot eyes mr musket gazed weakly over the top of a pair of pince-nez that hung at one side mr musket's voice was an overpowering boom contrasting oddly with the thin high-pitched tones of mr tuddenham mr tuddenham was as upright as a bantam mr musket drooped like a wilted lily no one had ever seen mr musket without mr tuddenham or mr tuddenham without mr musket alice appeared to have considerable difficulty over their names during which mr mcfee and mr hearty stood pretending not to be aware of the presence of the new arrivals eventually alice nodded reassuringly and taking a step into the room announced mr muddenham and mr tuskett tuddenham girl tuddenham shrieked mr tuddenham musket i said musket boomed mr musket for a moment alice regarded them with some apprehension then her face broke into a smile and with a sidewise nod of her head in the direction of the new guests and a jerk of her thumb she turned laughing to the door giving a backward kick of mirth as she went out the guests now began to arrive thick and fast miss torkington brought her tow-coloured hair and pince-nez in a manner that seemed to shout virtue and chastity she was all action and vivacity and nothing could damn the flow of her words just as none could have convinced her that in her pale blue princess robe with its high collar she was not the demure crier mrs bindle had taken up her position near the door so that she might correct alice should occasion arise the butcher and his missus announced alice 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 protested mrs bindle in a loud whisper you mustn't announce people like that you should say mr and mrs gash i asked him mum protested alice and that's what he said mrs bindle looked anxiously from mr gash in a check suit and red tie to his wife in a royal blue short skirt a pink blouse and white boots with tassels they smiled good-humouredly mrs bindle sighed her relief mrs bindle decided that it would be wise to leave alice to her own devices she knew something of the temper of the outraged domestic in consequence alice announced without rebuke mr hippet as mr pip pip and mrs muspratt as miss muskrat presently her voice was heard without raised in angry reproaches what's your name she was heard to demand i got to call it out no you don't ruthie dear was the reply mr hearty and mrs bindle exchanged glances they recognized that voice you let go i ain't one of them sort said the voice of bindle you ain't goin in till you give me your name so there was alice's retort the guests focused their attention upon the door suddenly it opened a foot and then crashed to again ah oh, thought you'd got through didn't you they heard alice cry triumphantly suddenly the door opened again and bindle entered with alice striving to restrain him now ruthie i'm married if i wasn't well anything might happen look here's my coat and at so don't say i haven't trusted you here le go bindle made an impressive figure in his evening clothes patent boots a large diamond stud in the centre of his shirt 
a geranium in his buttonhole and a red silk handkerchief tucked in the opening of his waistcoat hello arty he cried genially here call her arf indicating alice with a jerk of his thumb seems to have taken a fancy to me and she ain't the first neither he added mrs bindle motioned to alice to free bindle which she did reluctantly bindle looked round the room with interest this the little lot arty he inquired in a hoarse whisper audible to all don't look very cheer old crowd do they the idea of going to evan seems to make em low-spirited bindle regarded mr mcfee intently then turning to mr muskett who happened to be standing near him he remarked can't you see him in nightshirt with wings and an arp a flutterin about like a little canary wonderful place evan sir said bindle looking up at mr muskett sir boomed mr muskett bindle started back then recovering himself and leaning forward slightly he said do you mind doing that again sir just to see if i can stand it without jumping mr muskett glared at him swung round on his heel and joined mr tuddenham at the other end of the room seem to have trod on his toes muttered bindle as he watched mr muskett obviously explaining to mr tuddenham the insult to which he had just been subjected bindle looked about him with interest the only guest who seemed thoroughly comfortable and at home suddenly his eye caught sight of the text above the refreshment table and he grinned broadly looking about him for someone to share the joke he took a step towards his nearest neighbour miss torkington ain't he a knockout he remarked nudging her with his elbow i beg your pardon said miss torkington lifting her chin and folding her hands before her im arty said bindle ain't he a knockout look at that so shall ye all likewise perish he read fancy sticking that up over the grub miss torkington her hands still folded before her with head in the air wheeled round and walked away in what she conceived to be a dignified manner bindle slowly turned and watched her quaint old bird he muttered i wonder what i said to hurt her feelings the glee party of four had formed up near the harmonium mr hardy was in earnest conversation with the leader he wished to see lady knob carrick's arrival heralded with appropriate music the leader of the singers was a man whose serious visage convinced mr hardy that to him might safely be left the selection of the extra that was to welcome the patroness of the occasion mr hardy was unaware that in the leader's heart was a smouldering anger against lady knob carrick on account of her rudeness in the recent correspondence that had taken place furthermore he had already received his fee hi arty bindle called to mr hearty as he left the leader of the glee party when's the old bird comin mr hearty turned the old bird he interrogated with lifted eyebrows lady knob carrick bawled alice throwing open the door with a flourish lady knob carrick sailed into the room her head held high in supercilious superiority following her came her companion miss strint who had carried her self-suppression and toadyism to the point of inspiration immediately behind came john lady knob carrick's footman bearing before him the illuminated address the purse containing fifty treasury pound notes and the silver mounted hot water bottle bindle started clapping vigorously two or three other guests followed suit but the look lady knob carrick cast about her proved to them conclusively that bindle had done the wrong thing as most kind of your ladyship to come mr hardy fussed about lady knob carrick walking deprecatingly upon his toes she appeared entirely oblivious of his presence he turned towards the harmonium and made frantic signals to the leader of the glee party suddenly the quartet broke into song every word ringing out clearly and distinctly there's the blue eye and the brown eye the grave eye and the sad there's the pink eye and the green eye and the eye that's rolling mad but of all the eyes that i may be the merciful or bad the eye that i would choose is what they call the glad the glad eye the last line was rolled out sonorously by the bass the company looked at one another in amazement lady knob carrick scarlet with rage glared through her lorgnettes at the singers and then at mr hearty who from where he stood petrified gazed wonderingly at the glee party mrs bindle 
with great presence of mind moved swiftly across the room and caught the falsetto by the lapel of the coat just as he had opened his mouth to begin his solo verse dealing with the knowledge acquired by a flapper from the country in the course of a fortnight's holiday in london mrs bindle made it clear to the leader that as far as the alton road chapel was concerned he was indulging in an optical delusion we're all deeply honoured by your ladyship's presence this evening said mr mcfee throwing himself into the breach it is get me a chair demanded lady knob carrick still glaring in the direction of the glee singers bindle rushed at her with a frail-looking hemp-seated chair which he proceeded to flick with his red silk pocket handkerchief won't be enough mum he inquired solicitously lady knob carrick regarded him through her lorgnettes mr sopley had been detached from his contemplation of the ceiling and was now led up to lady knob carrick ah he exclaimed we are indeed greatly honoured ear ear broke in bindle attracting to himself the attention of the whole assembly will your ladyship make the presentation now inquired mr hearty or no was lady knob carrick's uncompromising reply as she seated herself fetch a table please she added indicating with an inclination of her head her footman who stood with what bindle called the prizes mr hearty and mr gash trotted off to fetch a small table from the corner of the room this was placed in front of lady knob carrick and on it john deposited the illuminated address the bag containing the notes and the silver mounted hot water bottle a hush of expectancy fell upon the assembly lady knob carrick rose and was greeted by respectful applause her manner was that of a peacock deigning to acknowledge the existence of a group of sparrows from a dorothy bag she drew a typewritten paper which she proceeded to read i have been asked to present to the rev james sopley as a mark of the esteem in which he is held by his flock an illuminated address a purse of fifty pounds and a silver mounted hot water bottle she paused for a moment a trifle that shall remind him of the loving hearts he has left behind murmurs of respectful appreciation mr sopley has fought the good fight in fulham for upwards of twenty-five years and he is now about to retire to enjoy the rest that he has so well and thoroughly earned ear ear from bindle i trust and hope that the lord will spare him for many years to come i'm sure that i would if i was god whispered bindle to mr tuddenham who only glared at him we have no among us continued lady knob carrick a new pastor a man of sterling worth and sound religious principles that's you said bindle in a hoarse whisper nudging mr mcfee who stood next to him i have proceeded lady knob carrick sat under him oh naughty naughty whispered bindle lady knob carrick glared at him sat sat under him for a number of years at barton bridge where he will always be remembered as a man devoted to temperance fates interpolated bindle the result of the interruption was electrical lady knob carrick dropped her lorgnettes and lost her place mr mcfee's adam's apple moved up and down with alarming rapidity testifying to the great emotional ordeal through which he was passing mr hearty looked at mrs bindle mrs bindle looked at bindle everybody looked at everybody else because everyone had heard of the temperance fate fiasco lady knob carrick resumed her seat suddenly then it was that mr hearty had an inspiration with a swift movement that precipitated him on the foot of miss torkington whose anguished expression caused bindle to mutter fancy her being able to do that with her face he landed beside mr sopley he managed to detach his eyes from their contemplation of the ceiling and impress on him that he had better make a reply as he walked the few steps necessary to reach the table bindle once more started clapping vigorously a greeting that was taken up by several of the other guests but in a more modified manner in a mournful and foreboding voice thoroughly appropriate to an hour of national disaster mr sopley thanked lady knob carrick for her words and the others for their notes he referred to the shepherd dragged in the sheep scooped up the righteous cast out the sinners in short he said all the most obvious things in the most obvious manner he promised the alton rotors harps and halos and threw the rest of fulham into the bottomless pit with some dexterity he linked up sin and the taxicab saw in the motor omnibus the cause of the weakening moral fibre of the working classes expressed it as his conviction that europe was being drenched in blood because fulham thought less of faith than of football he was frankly pessimistic about the future of the district 
an attitude of mind that appeared to have been induced by the garments of the local maidens fire and flood he promised fulham but made no mention of hammersmith or putney in a voice that throbbed with emotion he took his official leave having convinced everybody that only his intercessionary powers with heaven had stalled off for so long the impending fate he outlined taking up from the table the bag of fifty pounds he put it in his pocket and with bowed head walked towards the nearest chair ere you've forgotten your bedfeller sir cried bindle picking up the silver mounted hot water bottle and the framed address and carrying them over to mr sopley mr mcfee prepared himself for the ordeal before him standing in front of lady knob carrick as if she had been an altar he bowed low before her your ladyship a pause of veneration my friends he continued few ministers of the gospel have the privilege that has been extended to me this evening it is the will of the almighty that i succeed a most saintly man murmurs of approval in the person of mr sopley it will be a difficult position for me to feel mr sopley wagged his head from side to side in her brilliant oration her ladyship has emphasized some of the attributes of a man whose godliness she can all testify you shan't keep me out you baggage can't i hear his dear voice my andrew oh andy andy and they want to keep me away from you the interruption came from the door where alice was vainly endeavouring to keep out a dishevelled looking creature who finally broke through and walked unsteadily towards the table lady knob carrick turned and stared at the apparition through her lorgnettes mr mcfee's jaw dropped mr sopley for the first time that evening seemed to forget heaven and devoted himself to terrestrial things everybody was gazing with wide-eyed wonder at the cause of the interruption oh my andrew my little andy cried the woman in hoarse maudlin tones her hair to which was attached a black toque with a brilliant oval of embroidery in front hung over her left ear her clothes ill-fitting and much stained hung upon her as if they had been thrown rather than put on her face intended by providence to be pretty was tear-stained and dirty her blouse was open at the neck and her boots mud-stained and shapeless what what is the meaning of this demanded lady knob carrick of mr mcfee as she rose from her chair a veritable radamanthus the girl who was now hanging to mr mcfee's arm turned and regarded lady knob carrick over her shoulder he's my boy she sputtered then closing her eyes her head wobbled from side to side as if her neck were unable to support it you're what thundered lady knob carrick my my boy drawled the girl husband oh andy andy and she clung to mr mcfee the more closely in spite of his frantic efforts to shake himself free mr mcfee what is the meaning of this demanded lady knob carrick i i've never seen her before stammered mr mcfee looking as if he had been grabbed by an octopus on my oath your ladyship before my god andy andy don't say such awful things protested the girl you know you married me secret because you said helen wouldn't let you and she sagged away again half supporting herself on mr mcfee's arm do you know anything of this woman demanded lady knob carrick of miss mcfee miss mcfee shook her head as if the question were an insult then it was a secret marriage lady knob carrick remembered what she had heard of mr mcfee's conduct at the temperance fete mr mcfee you have you have disgraced your ladyship on my honour i swear don't andy don't said the girl striving to put her hand over his mouth don't god may strike you dead he did it once didn't he oh i've learnt the bible she added in a maudlin tone i can sing hymns i can she began to croon something in a wheezy voice mr mcfee made a desperate effort to free himself from her clutches but succeeded only in bringing her to her knees look at him look at him shrieked the girl knocking me about what he swore to love honour and obey oh you devil andy how you used to behave and now and now i swear it's all a damn lie it's my enemy my enemy woman i know thee not thou art the scarlet woman of babylon get thee from me i curse thee mr mcfee's gaelic blood was up go to it sir said bindle go it you have come as the ravening wolf upon the sheepfold at night to destroy the lamb mr mcfee waved his disengaged arm you being the lamb sir go it i'll have the law on ye, woman i'll have the law on ye, ye impostor ye harlot ye daughter of belial he flung his arm about and his eyes rolled with almost maniacal fury my god my god why persecutest thou me he cried lifting his eyes to the ceiling 
then with a sudden drop to earthly things he appealed to lady knob carrick your ladyship your ladyship do not believe this woman she lies she will ruin me i will have her arrested fetch the police i demand the police lady knob carrick turned towards the door at the entrance of which stood her footman john blow your police whistle she ordered practical in all things john disappeared a moment later the raucous sound of a police whistle was heard in continuous blast that's right shouted the woman that's right blow your police whistle blow your pinkish brains out then with a sudden change she turned to mr mcfee oh andy andy you never was the same after you had that drink in you down in the country at the temperance fete don't you remember how you laughed with me about that old bird being washed out of her courage it's a lay it's a lay a damnable lay shrieked mr mcfee mr mcfee was interrupted in his protestations by a sudden rush of feet and the hall began to fill with a wild-eyed dishevelled crowd mothers carrying their babies or pulling along little children everyone inviting everyone else to come in one woman was in hysterics lady knob carrick stared at them in wonder what is the meaning of this she demanded of no one in particular it's a raid mum a raid it's a raid sobbed a woman leading two little children with the hand and holding a baby in her disengaged arm lady knob carrick paled a raid she faltered yes mum can't you hear the police whistles well i'm damned broke in bindle slapping his leg in ecstasy then a moment after seeing the terror in the women's faces he cried out it's all right there ain't no raid don't be frightened it's old calves with that bloomin police whistle tell that fellow to stop cried lady knob carrick a special constable pushed his way through the crowd what is all this about please he demanded there's a raid sir cried several voices i give this woman in charge cried mr mcfee dramatically pointing at her who claimed to be his wife with alacrity the special pulled his notebook out of his pocket the charge sir he inquired she says she's my wife the special looked up from his notebook that is not an indictable offence sir i'm afraid but she's now my wife protested mr mcfee another rush of people seeking shelter swept the constable on one side and when he once more strove to take up the thread the woman had disappeared the results of john's vigour with the police whistle were far-reaching omnibuses had drawn up to the curb and had been promptly deserted by passengers and crew the trains on the district railway were plunged in darkness and the authorities at putney bridge station and east putney telephoned through that there was a big air raid although nothing had been heard at headquarters it was deemed advisable to take precautions special constables nurses and ambulances were called out anti-aircraft stations warned and tens of thousands of people sent scuttling home bindle was one of the first to leave the schoolroom and he made his way over to dick little's flat at chelsea ah cried dick little as he opened the door nancy's back this way he added walking towards the bedroom in front of the dressing-table stood private nancy dane the far-famed pirouette of the passion deo perros he was in the act of removing from his closely cropped head a dark wig to which was attached a black toque with an oval of vivid coloured embroidery well what's that he remarked as he laid it on the table hello bindle he cried all clear all clear replied bindle as he seated himself upon a chair and proceeded to light the big cigar that dick little handed him dick little threw himself upon the bed you done it fine remarked bindle approvingly as he watched dane slowly transform himself into a private of the line poor old mac he added he got the wind up proper good show what queried dick little as he lazily pulled at his pipe tired after a long day's work in the hospital seemed a bit cruel to me said dane as he struggled out of a pair of hefty-looking corsets cruel cried bindle indignantly as he sat up straight in his chair cruel with him a-tryin to take the gal away from one of the boys what's fightin at the front cruel it wouldn't be cruel mr nancy if he was cut up and salted and given to the uns as a meat ration and with this ferocious pronouncement bindle sank back again in his chair and puffed away at his cigar sorry said dane laboriously pulling off a stocking right o said bindle cheerfully then after a pause he added i got to thank old amlet for that little idea and you sir for finding mr nancy did it wonderful well he did still remarked bindle meditatively i wish they adn't blown that police whistle 
them poor women and kids was that scared made me feel i didn't ought to have done it but then how was i to know that the old bird was going to anky panky like that with the calves took her name they did that's something anyhow old mac won't go hangin round millikins again for many a long day if he does i'll punch his bloomin ed the next day lady knob carrick and john were summoned for causing to be blown to the public confusion a police whistle and although the summonses were dismissed the magistrate said some very caustic things about the insensate folly of excitable women he furthermore made it clear that if anybody blew a police whistle in the southwestern district because somebody else's wife had come back unexpectedly he would without hesitation pass a sentence that would discourage any repetition of so unscrupulous and unpardonable an act mr mcfee cleared his character to some extent by a sermon on the following sunday upon the ninth commandment and by inserting an advertisement in the principal papers offering twenty pounds to any one who would give information as to the identity of the woman who on the night of the twenty eighth had created a disturbance in the alton road school room End of chapter 8 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com